you want to start? Okay. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you again for coming to Think Tank. Um, today we have Albi um, Ravuni, who's a PhD, or who is a postdoc here at the Punt Lab um, and at the Alaska Fisheries Science Center, talking about incorporating key links between temperature and biology in end to end ecosystem models with a case study from the Gulf of Alaska. Albi, take it away. Thanks. Thanks, Emily. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, so what I want to do for the next hour or so, I uh, wanted to talk about what we've been doing uh, for this project for the past two years, two and a half, um, and uh, kind of like focus on a piece that we're trying to write up now uh, about uh, in incorporating basically like how, how do we capture temperature effects uh, in uh, in an ecosystem models and uh, i'll be talking a lot about the gulf of alaska uh, so that's going to be although that, that that picture is a lie those are the evolution islands actually but never mind that um let me see if i can there we go so i'll kind of start from the end uh, and uh, acknowledge the many, many people that are working and have been working uh, on this project and contributed in different capacities to many aspects of this work. Um, and uh, you, many of you will be online, some of you will be online, you know who you are, uh, many of them are not listed here, uh, but it's, it, it, it's really like a lot of people have chipped in and uh, I'm, it, it's been awesome to kind of exchange ideas with people with a you know, a bunch of different backgrounds and uh, uh, skills, and uh, it's it's uh, I've learned tons in the process for sure. And uh, I acknowledge the founders as well, so NPRB and uh, and Noah. So what I'll do, I'll I kind of structure this talk in three parts. First, I'll uh, give you a little bit of background on what this is all about, what the project is about, uh, and what the model does, or how we put it together at least. Uh, part two will be about you know the, the, the juice of it, hopefully. So uh, how do we integrate temperature effects on uh, uh, biology in Atlantis? And then I'll kind of talk about the simulation scenarios that we've been running. I'll present some results. Uh, keep in mind uh, walking in that this is all a work in progress, what you see. And uh, I welcome feedback. Anybody can interrupt me as I go. Uh, Maybe you can monitor and read the, the, the chat and the hands or yeah. what have you. Um, and so yeah, I'll, I'll probably also ask a couple of questions as we go. Um, uh, if people have, have ideas, it's, it, it, it's all more than welcome. And then I'll close by talking about where we go next. So um, so what after, after we uh, incorporate all these effects. So I'll start with a little bit of narrative about this, about the project itself. Um, we we talk about the Gulf of Alaska today, and we talk about fisheries. So uh, in the recent past, where by recent I mean last few decades, uh, the Gulf of Alaska has been subject to uh, changes in temperature, including heat waves, maybe most notably, but not only heat waves. Um, so it's also been exposed to uh, slowly increasing temperature, seawater temperature. And this has had an effect on uh, on the system productivity and on some of the commercial fisheries. The most notable example was the the Pacific cod in the Gulf of Alaska, the Pacific cod fishery after the 2013 to 2016 heat wave took a blow. And uh, it's not the only example. Our other stocks have also have also been negatively affected. So uh, temperature matters in this in this system, which is a productive system and supports a lot. A lot of fisheries. Um, so in this context, uh, there is uh, a mandate increasingly in different jurisdictions, not only in the United States but around the world, to manage fisheries uh, with an ecosystem approach. And uh, in the context of an ecosystem approach, climate change is important, right? So it's the, 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 there is a drive to evaluate how these fisheries are changing, how these stocks are responding to um, uh, climate change and localized warming conditions. And uh, in Alaska, something that has uh, taken some uh, uh, great strides in that direction was uh, the A-Climb project, which people, probably many people will be familiar with, 
to some extent at least it's uh, um, a climb stands for Alaska climate integrated modeling project it was a project that was launched that I, I think around 2015 is my is my understanding um, in and was focused in the Bering Sea and uh, the, the the underlying idea of the project was to uh, build uh, and apply an ensemble of models to uh, address management questions and uh, the, some of the key outcomes of this project were uh, that they highlighted that uh, EBFM, so system based management, uh, can have beneficial effects in the in a, in a context of of uh, incre other uncertainty due to due to uh, warming climate. And so, uh, with that in mind, uh, and and uh, yeah, I, I won't go into details about the, about this particular project. But what they did, they 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 downscaled the number of oceanographic models and uh, uh, developed and applied a number of uh, not only biological but also social economic models to kind of tackle this question from a number of different perspectives and, and, and points of view. And uh, it, it's in this, uh, along these lines, in, in some sense at least, that uh, a few years later, the, the Gulf of Alaska sister project was, was launched, uh, dubbed Goa Climb. It, this was also an integrated modeling project with the idea of, uh, uh, again, building and applying an ensemble of models to ultimately uh, forecast, well, understand first and then project uh, uh, the, the effects of warming on the on the Alaska communities that depend on fisheries. And there are a few participating institutions, most notably, it, it, it's, an, it's an Alaska Fisheries Science Center-led project, but also uh, includes also UW and, and, and uh, folks at DFO and CSIRO. Um, and the, the this project has more than one aim. Uh, the one that I will focus on today, because that's what I do, is uh, the, the Atlantis model. But uh, people here at, at, at UW as well, like Liz McCurran, have done a lot of great work on, on, on different objectives of, of Goa Climb. Um, but yeah, today we'll be talking about Atlantis. So what's Atlantis, first of all? Um, Atlantis is what you would call an end-to-end -end ecosystem model, or a whole of ecosystem model. So it's basically a framework that attempts uh, to uh, capture or at least approximate all components of the ecosystem, from the physics to the socioeconomic components uh, going through the food web interactions and so the biology. And it was first developed by Beth Fulton at CSIRO. Um, it's all these components are two-way coupled, uh, so they, uh, they kind of interact with one another. You have a 3D spatial structure, allows for flexible representations of fishing, and it's been used for a while. It's been used for about 25 years, 30 years or so. Uh, the, I'm getting a little bit of feedback. I'm not sure. That's it. I don't know why my, yeah, it's me. Of course it's me, it's always me. Uh, Okay, here we go. Um, so the, the, the aims of, of, of this project were to develop this model and apply it in two modes. One would be the high cost. So explore the uh, ecosystem level effects of the heat wave. So there was interest to uh, look at the 2013 to 2016 heat wave and its impacts on the ground fish stocks and fish condition and uh, other properties of the Gulf of Alaska ecosystem. Um, and then uh, the, the roadmap was to go from that to a projection study, so to use Atlantis, and not only that, because Atlantis is one of a, of a set of models that are being developed in the scope of, of, of Goa Climb, including uh, some eco eco frameworks and the uh, Seattle model that Grant Adams is working on, uh, plus some other uh, single species projection models. But, the, the, the idea related to Atlantis, at least, was to use it in projection mode as well to uh, then explore things like the optimum yield cap on Gulf of Alaska groundfish in the scope of climate change. And uh, we, we sort of soon realized that, that uh, both, for both of these two objectives, one key thing was going to be, right, how do we integrate temperature into this model? Atlantis is a deterministic model. so. 
it's the, 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 the assumption that you make around how you integrate mechanisms and uh, uh, the effect of variables on the biology matter and matter a lot. And when you build one of these frameworks to explore climate change scenarios, it's, it, it's important that you kind of stop and, and, and have a look at what you're doing in that. Um, and uh, to kind of convince you uh, um, about that is uh, this slide, which is uh, uh, just like some examples of what we know about the effects of increased temperature in the Gulf of Alaska. And uh, the, the, uh, the, the most recent example that we have is from the 2013 to 2016 heat wave. Uh, again, it's not the only one, but there's, there are studies that have been uh, published since and are being published still that have shown that from the bottom of the food web, so the, the bottom tropic levels of the phytoplankton and the zooplankton have, have changed uh, and uh, the, the abundance of some, the, 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 the biomass and the abundance of some of these taxa has changed, has not necessarily always declined. Some, some of these taxa have benefited from, uh, from, from the new situation that arised in, 20, in 2013. Uh, but a lot of the diatoms, for example, declined in, in, in biomass and a lot of the cold water topicals that are nutrient rich did the same. And uh, this had consequence on the forage fish, for example. Uh, forage fish like capelin and sandlins got smaller after the well, during and after the heat wave compared to before. Uh, the energy content was lower for sandlins. Uh, basically, there wasn't enough to eat. Uh, so the food limitation was one of the main uh, uh, bottom-up issues that arose during the, during the heat wave. Uh, and it kind of trickled up. Um, mediated by different mechanisms, undoubtedly, uh, but COD uh, uh, showed a pretty low recruitment during the heat wave years um, and uh, going all the way up to the end of the food web. Um, seabirds and marine mammals had uh, breeding failures and die offs because uh, if you rely on some of these forage fish and there's enough of it to eat and the energy content is too low. There, there will be consequences on, on, on your population dynamics as well, most likely. Um, so if we are to use models like Atlantis or some of these frameworks to explore climate scenarios like many of us do, um, it, it, it's important that we evaluate the assumptions that we make about the how all these processes basically take place, right? Because again, we're talking about mechanistic models. Okay, on track. Um, what I'll do now, I'll cover the main uh, features of this model, uh, just so everybody has an idea of wh what we're talking about. And there's probably more than a couple of people in the audience that have seen some of these slides before, so sorry about that. But I think it's important to kind of set the scene a little bit. Um, and the, the first thing that I'll say is that uh, the, Putting this together has taken us almost three years now. So one of the main drawbacks of developing something like this is that it, it does take time and, uh, and, and effort and, and, uh, and, and, and data, as you will see. But um, here we go. So this is the model domain, and uh, it basically extends to British Columbia uh, to the beginning of the Aleutian Islands. And it, this is a shelf model. So we focus on the Gulf of Alaska continental shelf. We don't attempt to capture the big embayments like Prince William Sound and Cook Inlet or the southeast um, fjords of Alaska. Um, and uh, basically, those lines that you see are the spatial products, the spatial units uh, that Atlantis processes are resolved at. And uh, uh, you see there the 2D structure in space. There's also a vertical structure. So each of those. Uh, Jaggedy polygons also has vertical layers uh, to kind of approximately capture the the, the bathymetry and the, the stratification, for example, of some of the some of the ecological properties of the Gulf. And the the, the, the way that the polygons are, are set up is to capture things like management areas and uh, the spatial extent of surveys and bathymetry. Uh, Atlantis has a physical submodule, so we took ROMS models. ROMS is a uh, is a regional. 
downscale, the, well, it's a dynamically downscale product that basically takes Earth system models and uh, uh, downscales it to regional uh, spatial scales. So we took one of those models for the Northeast Pacific and uh, we mapped it to the, to the Atlantis geometry. And uh, the variables that we care about really are um, temperature and salinity and water transport. So basically it's an exercise in um, rescaling the output of the rounds to the input that Atlantis needs over time. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm breezing through, but if people are interested in any of these, just follow up with me afterwards. Um, from a biological standpoint, uh, I mean, it's an end-to-end -end model, right? But you can't represent everything uh, in a single species way. So we have about 80 species or functional groups in the model. And uh, a lot of the, uh, oh, I would say most of the brown fish, all of the tier three stocks and most of the ground fish stocks are represented as single species groups, but then we do aggregate from a functional and taxonomic standpoint uh, for, for other groups. And uh, uh, all of the vertebrates are age structured in Atlantis um, and everything else is just represented as a barber school. Um, and uh, as you can imagine, this is a lot of parameters that you need. Uh, and uh, when we can, we take these from Gulf of Alaska stock assessments. When that fails, uh, well, when that is not available, then you you, you got to resort to the literature and to global databases and things like that. So it's a big uh, exercise in collating different data sources, essentially. Uh, one of the key features of these models are the spatial distributions, and I won't go into details, but the way that we uh, developed those for most stocks was uh, with uh, species distribution models. And uh, the main, uh, the centerpiece from a data standpoint was the, the bottom troll surveys from the, from the Gulf of Alaska and from Canada as well, because obviously you have the, the, the boxes in Canada. Um, one detail here that I will highlight is that the, the resulting distributions refer to the summer because that's when the surveys are done. So that's something to bear in mind when we think about temperature effects and a little bit more on that later. Uh, the, the, the engine of, of these models is the, the food web and the tropic interaction. So these are food web models um, and uh, so the parameterization of the diets was also kind of a big step of putting the, the, the framework together and was done with the mainly, mainly with bottom troll data from the Alaska Center, uh, but obviously not everything is captured by those, so you have to resort um, uh, to other data sources as well for that too. Uh, and the last bit that is relevant here is fishing. So there's, there are, mm, a few different ways to capture, to represent fishing in, in, in Atlantis. And uh, for the purpose of what I'm talking about today, uh, a fixed app we, we, we deemed to be uh, good enough uh, in that we're, we're not interested in reproducing historical patterns necessarily of removals, nor we were interested in uh, uh, fishing so much for this particular application here. Um, so uh, for these purposes, we set on a kind of a fraction of FMSY for everything that you have FMSY for, and then quarter M for other exploded species. Um, but the, the idea is that you just want to represent some, some level of light fishing. Uh, then you can do other things. And I'll, I'll touch on one of the other options uh, in one of the last few slides. Uh, the only thing that I'll highlight um, with this figure is don't don't focus so much on the color of the of the of the dots and all that. But one thing that is important to do with these models when you're done putting them together is to evaluate the sensitivity uh, of the different stocks to different levels of fishing. In that, when you parameterize them the first time, you may, uh, for example, over parameterize recruitment. So you may have a stock that is too productive compared to what what it should be in reality, or not as per, not not productive enough. So the idea is that if you expose the the model to an increase in value of F, you can see, for example, 
how fast uh, a certain stock, the, 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 the spawning balance of a certain stock declines, for instance, and uh, compare that to uh, uh, the knowledge that you have of the stock from stock assessments. And that gives you a rough indication of whether you parameterize the productivity of that stock appropriately or if you should go back to the drawing board and correct. Um, I don't think I'll go into uh, much more details for that figure, but if, if people are interested in, 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 in the phishing aspect for this application, just, just let me know, we can talk about it later. So Atlantis is not a fitted model, it's, it's tuned so, or, or calibrated. So what you have to do is you have to... Albi, I have one question yep. for Jim. Jim, do you wanna unmute yourself and ask your question? Hi, hi, Albie, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Could you go back one slide? Sorry, just on the, <clears throat> so that those are hypotheses on catch. Oh, so 400,000 tons of cod seems a little bit high in the catch scheme. And I'm not, I'm just worried. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Uh, no, absolutely. So wh wh what you're looking at there is, uh, so the, the, the point all the way to the left would be uh, Atlantis's take on, on fish biomass. So I would, I would suggest to not, not look at those as absolute values necessarily. What happens here is also that you're, I'm applying, say, an F of, I don't know, 0.1 equally across species right which is not obviously what you would do but this is a sensitivity analysis so what happens is that you have uh, the biomass of a stock that is a function of f so how much you're taking out but it's also a function of the biomass of all the other stocks that that stock is feeding on and is being preyed upon because you have all the tropic dynamics that are going on as well so those values are they're not meant to represent the golf as it should be. So that, that is way too much cod, and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm aware of that. Cool, thanks. Yeah, sure. They figured it was some way to uh, get the scales. Cool. Yeah, and one thing that could be done in that direction is uh, repeating this exercise uh, by fishing at, at, when I say reasonable levels, something approximately close to the level of F that is actually being applied. And then for a small subset, say, you know, those four or five key ground fish stocks do this like increasing F, but everything else should be fixed. You know, well, not fixed, but like should be fished the, the way the, the, the way that it's been fished historically, for example. At that point, you should see you would you would hope at least you would hope to see more reasonable levels of, of both biomass and catch. Because the catch is a function of the biomass in the end, right? So like it's that six million tons of cod that is what is throwing the whole thing uh, off, really. Okay. So the way that we calibrate these models is uh, uh, we don't just look at total biomass, ideally. Um, so in, in absence of fish, so when, when you calibrate this, typically it happens in absence of fishing, right? Because you want to make sure that you have the population dynamic parameters, kind of in the right ballpark at least. And uh, you, um, you may look at things like biomass, but then we're interested in things like weighted age and numbers at age. So making sure that the the size and age structure of the stock is meaningful. Uh, that's, an ex that's an example from a few weeks ago. So things have gotten better now, but like the, the, the idea is you, you want the end of the, if, if you're not applying fishing, if you're not fishing them out and if they're not dying for other reasons, you would hope them to kind of stay uh, uh, close to the way that they were in the initial condition. And uh, it's a spatial model, so we try and make sure that the spatial dynamics also make sense in the model output and that the diets make sense as well. Like that, that caption is cut, but it doesn't matter. It's just a, an example. That, I think that those are diets over time for the 10H classes that we have for COD. 
Uh, so just you know, just the things that we look at is that you know, like the the, the shift in the diets happen and why uh, it should not happen during modern calibration, typically. Uh, but yeah, that hopefully just gave you an idea of like the the tuning process that goes into 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 the model before you can even start uh, using it for for instance. Okay, so with all that being said, uh, I'll kind of jump into what we are doing here for this particular study. Um, so to me, the questions that make sense in this in this context is okay. We we, we built this model. It took some time. We've we've more or less calibrated it. Um, now we would like to go and use it to say look at the look at the heat wave, right? The the 2013 heat wave in the Gulf of Alaska. So before we get to that, uh, I'm interested in figuring out how the model responds to, for example, a warmer temperature. How the model responds to a reduced primary productivity and how assumptions around these um, dynamics or around biological parameters that these dynamics are hinged on, uh, uh, how do these assumptions matter uh, for these things? Uh, that figure is just a time series of, uh, of uh, surface. It might be surface, it might be bottom, tem oh, bottom temperature. Yeah, it's bottom temperature for the gun. That's from Rome, so that's that, that model that I was talking about before uh, that we that we use to force Atlantis. Okay, so there are a couple of things that you can do uh, as far as Atlantis goes to capture thermal sensitivities. One is to set up uh, thermal preference niches, which is another word of saying uh, maximum and minimum temperature, tolerance temperature for a particular species. So um, the, 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 the panels up top comprise are basically you, what you do, you calculate a scalar on the abundance, whereby the species won't be allowed to exceed the thermal ranges that are known for the distribution of the species. And the, 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 the purpose of this is to kind of limit the, the the movement so to affect the the, the spatial distributions of, 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 of your stops and uh, this is why before I said that the the distributions that we built were uh, were representative of summer conditions because they're based on summer data but recently uh, Batiste here helped us with building some uh, uh, distributions for for some stops only for the winter time uh, from uh, fishery dependent data. And uh, it basically it's important because different boxes will warm up at different rates over time uh, or will experience different temperature anyway. So where the fish is seasonally is likely important. And that's what I'm trying to uh, figure out here. Um, you can basically do the uh, apply the same principle to spawning. There are some, some some recent studies from uh, from Ben Laurel and colleagues uh, that have looked at uh, cod, and uh, the there is a thermal window for hatching for cod that I think is between approximately three and seven degrees Celsius. Uh, if, it, if it gets much past that, the the hatching success of the of the of the eggs is greatly reduced. Which again, if you have a winter spawner, it, it matters uh, with the phenology where the fish is in the winter. That's why um, we, we, we're looking at winter distributions as well. Uh, but that's one way of doing it with Atlantis. You can just say, okay, like they don't get to go in that uh, box or cell because it's too hot or it's too cold. Um, so yeah. Where do they go? What's that? Where do they go? If, if I mean the, the way that the model deals with it, they kills them off. Like they're not they're, they're not allowed to move to that cell anymore. If they're already there, whatever is in there basically dies off. And there's a couple of different ways that you can fine tune it. Uh, and uh, it's it's a fast moving uh, property of Atlantis as well these days. Uh, but uh, essentially. Basically, you can imagine it as uh, uh, another mask that you're going to superimpose to that, where it decides which of those cells are viable and which ones are. So it essentially impacts mortality and reproduction. Yeah. 
The other way that you can uh, think of temperature and plant is uh, the metabolism and the bioenergetic. So the that figure is uh, taken from the Atlantis user guide, and it's basically the way that uh, a lot of models uh, apply this concept uh, as a default. So basically what you do, you calculate a parameter that links temperature to some biological processes, which is what you have on the y-axis, and then you have temperature on the x-axis. And uh, historically, most often this was an exponential relationship of some kind, that you can parameterize in different ways, but that's what people refer to as a Q10 uh, relationship. Um, and then this color gets applied to different uh, biological rates. Um, the way that we've expanded this is uh, um, so that that's not that is the the picture up top is probably not particularly realistic or particularly. Uh, um, corresponding to what we know from bioenergetic theory. So for ectotherms, what we know is that it's going to be more something like what you see on the bottom panel. So there, the, you know, like as it gets warmer, there will be like some increase uh, in uh, consumption, for example, up until an optimum uh, temperature of theoretical consumption. And then things are going to uh, decline pretty fast after that up, up until the maximum. And, uh, so these curves have been uh, developed and integrated in uh, the in Seattle in the Seattle model by uh, Kirsten Holzman and, and, and Grant and others. And uh, the, for, for now, we we're trying to reproduce the same behavior in Atlantis for these four species. Um, ideally, over time, if more data becomes available, I think it'll be cool to extend this to other at least to other ground fish stocks. Um, but basically, the, the, the short of it is that it's two different ways uh, of capturing an effect of, of increased temperature on, on the model. Okay, moving on to uh, the simulation part of this, or how we're, how I'm thinking about it at least. So there are a couple of scenarios that I'm exploring, um, and uh, I'll go into some details in in the next few slides for, for each of them. But the idea is to have, uh, I'm call, I, I called it baseline, but you could call it base model or what have you. So your, your calibrated Atlantis model with everything that I've shown you so far in, in the last two slides about the way that we, that we incorporate temperature in the model and uh, kind of pre-heat wave, I, 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 I say cool here, but as in, not warm, <laughs> it's all relative, but if, if, if you think of Ironcast of what we know of, of the Gulf, or at least what we have data for, let's call it free heat wave and, and, and heat wave, if, if, if you wish. Um, that'll, that'll be kind of your, your, your base model. And then uh, um, scenario number two, it, it says, okay, let's apply warmer water, essentially, or not only water, but currents as well. So oceanographic conditions from for example, 2014, which is one of the heat wave years in the Gulf, um, and then uh, let's let's go about it from a different way. So, from scenario three, I say, okay, so what happens when it gets warmer in, in this ecosystem, at least, uh, is that some plankton taxa, uh, the productivity of some plankton taxa declines. Um, so let's let's slash that uh, by some value and uh, and see how the system responds and how these changes propagate up the food web basically, and then combine the two um, and see how 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 these two stack up. That's kind of part one uh, to it. Uh, to me, the other important thing is uh, okay. Other than the scenarios, uh, let's just talk like literally about the assumptions that we made. So whether we should use seasonal spatial distributions or maybe it doesn't matter that much in a model like Atlantis. Uh, should we uh, apply a different assumption to the way that the thermal preferences limit movement and spawning? Uh, should we apply some other flavor of bioenergetic effects? No bioenergetic effects at all. Uh, many models don't really include uh, uh, effects of temperature metabolism. Um, 
and then and then point four is is uh, is, is on my to do list. Uh, um, which yeah, that's that's what I just said. So like, well, I I think I tried to remove the bioenergetic effects at all. Number four is uh, you know like is it is it an exponential curve? Is it a bound curve? Which, which, which is it? Uh, and and does it matter or or maybe not really? But all of this is geared toward kind of understanding like how different model structures and different model setups will influence potential important results for in, in a minute context when we, when we explore climate related scenarios. Okay, so the first, uh, so I'll kind of cover the, the, the uh, I'll kind of cover points one and two here real quick, uh, just just to give people a, a visual representation of what I'm talking about. Um, so the, the the panel up top would be what I call baseline. Uh, those that's that's bottom temperature average across the whole model domain. So it's super highly aggregated. Uh, repeated over time so it's one year of forcing that you repeat for 50 years basically um, and that's not unusual in in in, in models like atlantis um, to kind of pick one year that you have forcings for and that you have good realistic forcings for and loop it over time if you're not interested in temporal variability and if anything in this case i would like to reduce temporal variability of my environmental variables to the extent possible uh, because that's yet another thing in the equation that at this time I'm not interested in. So we're talking about uh, model structure right now. Um, so the reason why the, the the panel in the middle, I don't know if people can see my cursor particularly, probably yes, but like the, so basically these first 30 years of this panel are, that's the same forcing that you have above. Um, and then after 30 years, you start applying the, the warm coursing. And, and that's for 20 years. I, I should probably extend that to at least a couple more decades. But anyway, um, that's, that'll be the warm scenario. Now, like somebody would ask, why, why, why is that, first of all? Uh, because a model like Atlantis has to burn through a lot of initial instabilities when you first initiate it. And so, because the model was calibrated on pre-heat wave conditions, it's good to let it do a spin-up or burning, some people call it, for a few decades so that it equilibrates before you start applying any forcing. That applies to any study that you do. Like it, it could be a, a Heinka study where you're applying uh, uh, actual forcings for the historical period. It could be a, for, a projection study where you apply future forcings. Most typically, you always want to allow for a few decades. Probably 30 years is cutting a, a little short. Maybe 40 would be more appropriate. But ideally, you would like most stocks at least to cycle through at least one generation. Uh, and if, if you have something that is as long as long lived as some of the wrong fish. You need potentially more than that. Um, but yeah, that's the idea behind the spin up. Um, and uh, what, what we do, we, we take the end of the run and we look at, the, at some metrics that I will uh, go over later. And, uh, and you basically see how things change between the two scenarios. Why 1999 and 2014? Uh, because, uh, well, the because of convenience, first of all, it's four things that we have in in our set of years for the hindcast from the ROMs. Um, well, 2014 would be the heat wave year, and we're kind of limited. We only have so many of those. Uh, the 1999 could be, you know, could be 2001, could be 2000, could could, could be anything else. But the idea is to have something that dates before the system started to warm at least relative to present conditions. Okay, and for the productivity scenario, instead, uh, so as I said, uh, one of the things that were observed in the Gulf during the during recent warming events was 
uh, diatoms, krill, and uh, some of the copepods, not all the copepods, but some of the taxa uh, to basically be less productive. And so one of the hacks that we can apply uh, in, in Atlantis is uh, uh, after, again, after the 30 years of burning uh, or spin up, uh, you basically impose a scalar on the productivity rates, which is not, which doesn't mean the biomass necessarily. So, if you slice the, the, the say the growth rates of, of these biomass pools uh, for 20 years, you may or may not have uh, uh, dynamics of the biomass that are stable over time. So this is the biomass relative to the control. You see that for the first two groups, like the biomass actually keeps declining over time but by the end of the of the study period is in a ballpark where uh, it makes sense with what was observed uh, during the during the heat wave theory of data for at least uh, and then the the the, the, the third the, the last case would be to take these two essentially and combine them right so the increased temperature and, the, and decrease the productivity okay um, Kathy, I have a question. Yeah. In the previous slide, when you're showing the um, biomass relative, is that so that's like over the years it's declining? Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah, because basically what happens is that up until year 30, the, the biomass in the two runs is identical because you've been applying the same, mm -hmm. the same forcing, right? And then uh, it, day one of year 30 you start slicing the productivity rates okay. and so the biomass will it will take some time and it will be it will be a shorter so for example for the last group for mm -hmm. the copper pods it takes pretty fast for them to kind of you know dip to a place where they kind of then stay stable for the rest of the run mm -hmm. uh, if you were to run the model for longer mm -hmm the same thing would likely happen to these okay. and that's hallmark probably of the fact that these these runs should be longer probably mm -hmm. so that, that's something that i that i want to work on uh, but yeah how much of a drop in biomass of diatoms for these these uh groups is to be expected under climate change under climate change oh, that's a good question like why why 0.5? Oh, well, that's something that you could, you could test different values of. Like, you, if in the end, uh, you would like to realize the, the, the 0.5 relative to the rate is not that important as an input. You would like the, the end biomass to be in a ballpark that makes sense to what you think, to what you would expect. Something, it, it, it's really hard to expect the other thing, to, to predict the other thing is that the taxonomic aggregation in Atlantis makes it so that in that group, mesozooplankton, there are taxa that have declined during the heat wave, but there are also some taxa that have done well during the heat wave. So it's it's difficult to parameterize. The idea is to right, let's make an assumption and say, you know, like it's it's reasonable like the, the, these taxa swing so fast that you know 60% of the of the of the original biomass sounds pretty reasonable to me, probably. Yeah. Um, but definitely, it, it, there will be something to test with some sensitivities, right? So, slice it by 0.2, slice it by 0.8. Yeah. At some point, because I, I play with it a little bit, and at some point, uh, there is a threshold after which uh, some of the plankton will die, and then your model is toast because. Uh, everything else will come fall with since yeah is there is this kind of like a first step before you start incorporating climate forecasts into the model yeah so in an ideal world what you would do instead of doing this uh hack of slicing the productivity, you would take MTZ output from ROMs and uh, match, make sure that your biomass matches them. Or even some people actually force Atlantis with output from ROMs. We don't, I, I don't do it with this model. Uh, it would be interesting to see how things change. Uh, but 
it, it, these these groups are fast turnover and they swing a lot. And uh, the like when you when you do something like this of just cutting productivity, it's really like you're in the realm of hypothesis testing, right? Like there is there is no chance that you could claim that. Well, you know, I mean, I guess you could, but like you you probably shouldn't claim that. that that's what happened. You're not into it. You know, there you yeah. go. But that's it's one way. It's one way of approximating it. And it's one way of then being able to tell, right? So like if, if, if you do that as opposed to touching temperature, or if you do that together with increasing temperature, how does the model, rather than the system, how does the model respond? Got it. Um, that makes sense. I have one question from Jim. Is it common to tune Atlantis with a mass balance food web? Um, like an example of EcoPath and EcoSim in an analogous way that stock assessment results are used? Um, and Jim, if you have anything to add, you should be able to unmute yourself. So, if 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 I understand the question, it, it's uh, yes. Yeah, so, you the 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 way that we've used the past EcoPath models for the Gulf was exactly that. Because when diet information is not available for for some species, which it isn't, because if you're including everything in the food web, uh, there's no chance that you'll have diet information for all of them. Uh, you do take uh, uh, results from uh, from a mass balance model like Ecopath and use that as kind of like the starting point at least of your of your Atlantis model. And then you have to you you might have to still tune the diets further instead of just plugging them in from from Ecopath if it makes sense. Good, thank you. Okay, so what I'll do now, I'll walk, um, I'll walk you through some slides that have kind of the the the, the results that we got so far. Um, all all of this is work in progress. So if if, if you have comments, please uh, speak up. But the idea is uh, uh, let's compare these three, right? These three scenarios. I don't know how much people online and here can actually read of that plot. Uh, but that's okay. Uh, I'll walk you through it. The, basically, what this is is uh, like the, the um, there are some of the species uh, that we have in the model here, and then uh, the red line uh, is basically the biomass at the end of the baseline run, right? So what what you assume to be uh, your 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 base case. Um, and then this column refers to uh, the scenario with increased temperature. And uh, without going over every single taxa, which is probably not particularly interesting or useful, uh, the, the, the point that I want to drive home here is that the, the, the changes to, and to terminal biomass just from uh, making the system warmer, basically, uh, are not a are not huge b they're not always negative uh oftentimes there's this well i don't want to say misconception but there's this assumption rather that you know increased temperature is bad uh no uh it, it varies across taxa uh, some of the fish species present some small increase in terminal biomass and uh, over the next couple of slides, hopefully we'll unpack why that is the case a little bit. Um, but focusing on total biomass only, uh, that's, that's, that's what happens. When then uh, you go and uh, slice the productivity, that's when you start seeing bottom-up changes that are a little more important. So again, people probably can't read it very well, but the, but the, the very bottom is the is a few zooplankton uh, taxa, uh, the, the bottom row of this figure. And uh, yeah, obviously, that's what we're imposing. We're imposing a, a, a decrease in their bomb, so that's not surprising. Although, you do also see uh, a, a an increase biomass in some of these taxa. And that's, and that's just a reminder that every time that you impose some uh, some forcing on a model like this, the outputs that you get will be function of your forcing as well as all the trophic connections that are in the model. So what happened there is that probably that particular group got released by predation because uh, the other ones declined essentially. Uh, 
But anyways, um, the, 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 only, the only thing that I wanted to, take, to uh, uh, highlight was the, uh, this panel. The, sec the second row is uh, forage fish. So basically everything that feeds on plankton, on things like krill and things like copepods. Um, and yeah, you do see how the, the, the food web uh, uh, module of Atlantis propagates uh, the decreased productivity. And then, uh, probably not particularly surprisingly, uh, if you combine the two, uh, you the, the 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 message here is that the, um, there's there's two things that are at play here. So one is the increasing temperature, and one is the food limitation, and they should probably both be considered or at least disentangled when we when we use these models for for uh, to explore uh, warming scenarios. Uh, and it seems that food limitation, uh, uh, maybe, maybe not trumps, but is, is more uh, important to the model than temperature alone. Um, so let's unpack that though a little bit. Um, if uh, with something like a plant, this is you, you get to look at the weighted age, right? So obviously, just for the age structure groups and uh, the the, those slight increases in biomass that you saw uh, were probably mediated by an increase in weighted age. Um, so this plot here again, let me let me walk you through it. You have now on the X you have uh, age classes. And that's something that I haven't mentioned before, but um, the way that we represent age classes is uh, not with annual age classes most of the times, well except except if the if the fish is short-lived, but uh, we're kind of limited in from a computational standpoint with how many age classes we can represent. So what most people do, well, what I did anyway, is uh, I relied on 10 age classes for most ground fish, for most fish groups, and those age classes will be of varying, um, uh, uh, well, will be more diverse essentially. So for something that is as long-lived as ocean, Pacific Ocean perch, you may have five year long age classes or something like that. Whereas for something like Pollock, you have one year long age classes. Um, but the, the only point that I wanna uh, highlight here is uh, uh, that bright yellow for hour two. Uh, so why is that? Um, well, that's model input simply. So um, the way that we uh, represented the bioenergetics here, if you look at this graph down here, you'll see that uh, our two flounder uh, just so happens to be the one species of the four that is most, uh, I don't know if temperature tolerant is the right word here, but has the highest consumption optimum anyway. Uh, and uh, in the Gulf, we're going to be kind of in the ballpark of like six to 10 C, depending, depending where you are. So obviously, increasing temperature, you'll be you'll be sitting on the ascending limb of this curve. So the point that I'm that I'm making is that if you just, if all you do is applying a warming, uh, the species goes heck yeah, that's great. Uh, increased consumption uh, because this scenario doesn't have any food limitation baked into it. Uh, as opposed to this one that is all about the food limitation and that's where you start seeing uh, things going on. So like that's that's the scenario where you slice the plankton productivity and if you look at the weighted age of things like sand lens and capelin, uh, that is what really got skinny uh, during the heat wave, um, you have some, some substantial declines there uh, and the uh, same goes for some of the ground fish species that rely on uh, on plankton, at least in their juvenile stages, uh, like Pacific Ocean perch and, and pollock, uh, in part at least. Um, and you don't see as much I, I, I don't see as much of a bottom up effect as I originally expected on uh, uh, say upper tropic levels such as seabirds, which is the second to last line. Uh, you can't read that from the colors here, but that's pretty close to zero. It's pretty close to no, not, not much going on. Um, and I'll, I guess I'll try and touch on that later. Yes. Sorry. Um, the, the 
production, the decrease in production, would that be 50% over the, you know, the length of the simulation, or would it be 50% slice averaging? It would be a 50% slice to the rate. So it 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 will translate in uh, not necessarily 50% decline, but it will be over time. Okay. Yeah. How about the plankton? Did, did you see any response in the plankton? Or the plankton does that? It's only quite plankton that you decrease. Uh, no, also also one of the zooplankton groups. One of yeah. The, so not yeah. So if, if, yeah, I know you probably can't see much here in person, but it's it's the but the bottom panel there. Yeah. Uh, those are basically negative. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Negative differences. Yeah. One yeah. that's positive. Yeah, and then it, it seems to propagate up a couple of tropic levels, yeah. but not more than that. So less than what I expected. Uh, I have another question from online, um, Karen. They ask, have you explored the spatial differences in thermal response for certain groups? Also, are there bio bioenergetics at thermal dependent consumption curves, each class specific? Uh, first, first part, yes. And uh, I, will, uh, I will show you uh, a little bit about that in, in a couple of minutes. Uh, this the second one was the the no they're they're not age they're not age specific and uh, it would be in, it would be cool if, if it were uh, but that's to my knowledge at least that's not something we can do yet in uh, in, in Atlantis at least it would be cool to have it um, on onto genetics so if, if not by age class at least it would be cool to have different response curves for juveniles and for adults, I think. Yeah. Um, uh, okay, and as, as I said before, nothing enlightening here, but um, uh, it, it basically, it's, you know, it, to, to me, when I, was, when I was looking at this, most typically what, what what you see, what you see, a lot of these models do, like they'll take column three, right? It will be like kind of like the base. So I say it, it, it's difficult to disentangle what comes from uh, the the tropic aspect uh, that is one of the main drivers of this model, and what comes from the bioenergetic and what you impose from from the temperature. Okay, um, so. Mm, numbers age, yes. Um, so what happens here is uh, uh, okay. Let, let's let's kind of step step through this a little bit. Um, the when you apply warmer war, war, warmer temperature forcings, you basically increase uh, mortality. So that's how it's formulated in a plant. So like you'll see some limited. Because we have this, so most of the mortality in Atlantis, I should highlight, comes from either fishing or tropic interactions. There is very little extra background mortality that we usually impose uh, on most of the species when we can. Uh, in this model, there is some uh, because we needed to attain a reasonable uh, population dynamics. And so that little bit of background mortality gets. Uh, Essentially amplified by the warmer temperature, and so you you see a you see a little bit of that going on. More interestingly than that, in my opinion, uh, you see uh, the strong effects on cod. So those really just come from the spawning limitations, um, and uh, I think to me that kind of highlights that it's important to in these mechanistic models at least. Uh, so when you're not feeding, it's important to capture some of these. When, when you have one of these key processes, it's important that you have your best tab and including it in the model because that's a 30% change in, uh, in, in cod numbers at age between the two runs, uh, which, you know, don't focus on the 30%, take it or leave it, but it's, uh, I, I think it's important. Um, and the last thing is that you'll see that the first age class of a lot of these uh, uh, got, a, got a bump up. Uh, that comes from the increased weighted age. So in Atlantis, the spawning is function of condition. 
uh, at least, well, to some extent. Um, and so that's kind of the effect that we're seeing there. Um, as you'd expect, uh, yeah, it was lower weighted age for forage fish, so uh, they struggle to spawn, they get too skinny. Uh, again, it's something along the lines of what was observed uh, in the Gulf in, in, in recent times. Uh, again, not really much of an effect at all on uh, anything past the ground fish, I wouldn't say. Uh, and I, for simplicity, I only included seabirds here, but there is with marine mammals and, and, and others. Uh, uh, yeah, okay, again, okay, combined. Uh, no, what I wanted to uh, do next was, yes, these questions that, that we, we got a couple of slides back. Uh, yes, it's it's good to look at things spatially when we can, uh, with a spatial model, obviously. And so um, we did have a look at, the, at how things changed spatially, obviously. And uh, I, the, the, the Please note that the scale is different between all these panels. So don't compare between panels, but look at the single species if it makes sense and how things change spatially for each single species. But on the screen there, you have three forage fish species on the on the left, and you have three ground fish stocks on the on the right. And uh, basically what happens here, the only thing that I want to highlight here is that depending on uh, whether your species is more of a demersal or pelagic um, organism, uh, the effects will be different, right? So like if you look at the, if you look at the three on the left, uh, maybe it's more evident for herring and capelin, but uh, the, the biggest declines in the, in the stock well, the biggest differences in the stock uh, were in the eastern part of the Gulf, eastern and northern, which is where it got uh, pretty hot, uh, for example, during the during 2014, which is the force in the reply, and less so uh, towards the Aleutians, where conditions didn't change as much. Um, whereas for the Mersal species, um, so like for cod, like if you look at, again, if you look at the scale, like it kind of, Changed the pretty much the same across the board, uh, but less so uh, closer, less so at depth essentially, where the difference in bottom temperature wasn't as big as in some of the shallower parts of the of the shelf in the Gulf. Um, but yeah, so the 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 the, the take on here is that uh, there will be some local depletions and. Uh, it, it's something that is good to look at when you when you look at the output of, of these models because it might it might give you an idea of why one of your stocks has declined or has done better uh, because there might be like some sub areas within the model domain where conditions got really bad or better for, for the species. And Albie, there's no like feedback loop with the fishing, right? Like if one of the cells that represents like a managed area dips too low, they're still gonna fish it, right? There's no kind of in, in, in this in this um uh study, let's say well in this piece here, yes, because we're just applying mm -hmm. a blanket at across the board, which is you know like dumb fishing. If you want to call it that, but when when you actually do uh, apply, uh, for example, either forced removals or um, or a meaningful F, like with a fleet structure, mm -hmm. then uh, you'll be able to decide uh, whether some cells are being targeted or well are open or not to yeah. the specific fishery of a certain stock. Mm -hmm. But in this case, no. In this case, F is basically you know if it's there, I'll take. Okay. You know, however much of it. If it's not, I won't. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. So my so I, I asked the, the the question a couple of slides ago that kind of stunned me a little bit. Why am I not seeing bigger bottom up effects on uh, the upper tropic level? So there is we have all this theory that shows us that. Uh, when when conditions got warm in the Gulf of Alaska, a lot of the 
let's call them top predators, but basically seabirds and uh, and uh, and and marine mammals, including uh, I, I think including stellar sea lions, importantly. Uh, then they, they didn't do so well uh, because of all the uh, bottom up effects, and that's not something that I can say that I uh, was able to reproduce here. And uh, uh, that's something that is going to need work, but my take on what happens is that there is some degree of prey switching. So something becomes unavailable, uh, I'll eat something else, essentially, which may or may not be sensible from an ecological standpoint. But if you if you go and look, uh, let's see, I don't know, the, the, but the bottom two panels are seabirds, right? And the, 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 the bars are the change in ingested prey between the treatment and the control, basically, right? So the the, the hot run and the cold run thing. And uh, yeah, sure, uh, there was less sandlands to eat, so they ate less of that. Uh, well, they switched to something else. In this case, was uh, an invertebrate group. Now, these obviously these are percentages, so. Uh, it doesn't mean that they completely made up for the missing uh, the missing diet, right? So, like the, you know, like if you slice, if you if all you eat is sandlands and uh, you lose ten percent of that, and you eat a tiny amount of crab and that doubles, you, you know, it, it it it's not a full compensation, I don't think. But I'm still looking into this, and it it seems apparent that for all of the predators, there is some degree of compensation whereby when one of the food sources becomes either unavailable or not as uh, uh, filling, I guess, uh, in terms of like basically the condition of what they eat, uh, they'll probably just switch to something else and get away with it. Um, so that's, that's something that I need to dig a little bit deeper into. Can I ask? Yeah, 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 sure. Um, the crabs, are they biomass pools or are they invertebrates? And and it's also like that specific group is one of those like super highly aggregated groups that include yeah, yeah a lot of species. So like they tend to show up a lot. So that's that's a that's specifically a fish eating uh, group of seabirds, right? And yet they'll take they'll take some invertebrates, yeah. you know, they'll take a little bit typically. Uh, but they seem to take more if if, if the fish declines, which which may be meaningful. I I don't know, but there I I would need to look into studies, diet studies from the Gulf uh, from those years. I, I I admit that I'm not I'm not too familiar, uh, except for a couple, to see if the if the you know inter invertebrate take increased. What we know is that the 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 intake of forage fish decline. Well, there was not to eat, basically. Um, so that's that tracks. But what doesn't track is that these big effects that were observed that don't really happen in the model. So these mass mortalities and these reproductive failures. So there's there's something else going on whereby either just by reserves or by switching to something else, they they scrape by. I guess it's a bit more difficult to control their overlap with the biomass pools too. That might be a link there. Um, because you have less control of the, the area that the biomass pool species is right. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. It yeah, for might sure. be worth looking into. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Okay. And that brings me to uh some that is really hot off the press, as in 20 minutes ago, um, and uh, it's so that was the, the the scenario part of this work, right? So another way of looking at that part that I've been talking about so far is uh, uh, it 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 gets hot. What happens? Is it just a temperature thing, or are there other ecological mechanisms and uh, uh, processes that we need to try and uh, capture in an offensive one. Uh, now we move to just like the, the, the mere assumption, uh, the, 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 the mere consideration of like how we represent this process, right? 
So um, you have uh, um, in this figure a few species on the X, uh, and you have their terminal biomass on the Y, and uh, the dots, um, the different dots, basically the the the, the, the two colors. So the, the darker ones are let's call it the cold, the 1999 uh, scenario, whereas the, the, the lighter green ones are the, the warmer condition, right? And, uh, and there's a couple of different assumptions there where the, basically you can think of the, the round the dots as the, the base model that I've been calibrating and building for the last two years, basically. So, based mainly on summer distributions and uh, with the thermal niches and the bioenergetics and, and all that that you've seen so far. Uh, and then the other three are a couple of variations of that. Um, one of them is including the having seasonal distributions instead of just the summer ones. Um, and then just removing the thermal tolerance at all uh, and removing the bioenergetics. So. And some of these are more reasonable than others, right? Because you, you would never expect an ectotherm to be completely decoupled from uh, from from temperature. So, like the 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 crosses, the last one is uh, you know purely academic here. But I thought it was it was nice to see that if you don't if you if you apply one of these models and you don't make any attempt at capturing any bioenergetic process at all, I mean you may as well not apply temperature scenarios, right? Like the, 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 the two are identical, at least for these particular species that I'm looking at, uh, or near identical. Um, but apart from the trivial one, which is that one, uh, the other thing that, uh, that I kind of noticed here is that, um, and I mean, there's, there's more, I, I have more to do, but like if, if you look at the warmer scenario, so the light green, uh, the, it's not always true, but in general, the spread, uh, the vertical spread of those dots is going to be a little bit more than than the dark blue, right? And uh, the 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 meaning of that is that the 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 assumptions are important, but become more important the warmer your system gets, the or the warmer the scenario that you're trying to project is essentially. Uh, which is which I mean, uh, maybe maybe it's stating the obvious, but it's again a way. Uh, of me, a way for me to highlight the fact that if 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 we if, if I want to use this thing to do you know end of century uh, RCT uh, projections, uh, it's it, it it would do us well to test some of these alternative formulations because the end result that we get will really depend on 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 what we put into the model in the first place. And that really, I, I mean, that really applies not only to temperature, you know, that applies to all components of an ecosystem model. But I think it's particularly important when the focus of the study is the, the thermal regime of the, uh, of the system. Okay. So, what I'll do next, and we're almost through, I will um, basically give you a, a, a quick idea, but very quick, uh, about what happens next. So, we, st step one, and we're still working on it, as you've seen, uh, will be, let's, let's wrap up uh, uh, all this stuff that I've been talking about, let's try and characterize a little bit the sensitivities of this model, different assumptions and all that. Um, and the, the end point or the next steps rather uh, will be, okay, let's let's use this then. Let's apply, let's, let's actually apply the model. And uh, all you've seen so far were the toy scenarios, right? Uh, I mean, you could call them that because it was one year of repeated forcings for the physics it was a fixed F. Um, for the Heinkas portion of this work, instead, we will, uh, well, we are, because we've started the simulations already, but we, we, we plan on forcing the model with uh, ROM's output 
um, that would be for the Lancaster, obviously, would be the blue bit. The blue bit actually goes further back because those are historical runs. I won't get into the difference between Lancaster and historical runs of runs for this talk, but um, it doesn't matter. Like we'll be we'll be we'll be thinking about the past and we'll be thinking specifically about the 2013 to 2016 window. Um, uh, and uh, for the catch, we, we we get to impose removals. So we have data. We we get to impose commercial catch removals for for the period. So we don't have to um, come up with an app necessarily. Um, whereas for the projection work, which I mean, it would be cool if it would be cool if we got to this. I want to say by the end of this year, maybe the beginning of next year, but. It, it, it's all in the making. We're preparing for things and, and all that. But the the, the goal here will be uh, to basically do scenario testing, right? So okay, let's take uh, a couple of different uh, system model or emission scenarios rather, and let's project them into the future, and uh, let's see what all this means basically. So other studies in the region. Uh, both published and uh, in uh, in prep are uh, considering similar questions, right? So, how should um, how should commercial fisheries management uh, pre well, not prevent but like uh, uh, anticipate uh, um, future changes? And uh, uh, can we evaluate a couple of different strategies and see how the system responds? Um, the model would include these uh, thermal responses that I've been talking about uh, and the, the energetic shifts and all that. The focus of the first uh, projection runs, uh, as far as our interest goes at least, will be the optimum yield cap in the Gulf for groundfish. So kind of evaluate that in the scope of uh, different scenarios of, of climate change, of which we have two, by the way, because we've, at least as of right now, for the ROMs, for the Gulf of a lot, well, for the Northeast Pacific ROMs model, we have uh, um, the kind of low emission and highest emission scenarios. And uh, it would be cool to like try something in between as well. I think that people in the Bering Sea have, 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 have done that. But I mean, we'll, we'll cross that bridge. But the, 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 the idea is to. Um, Essentially, use this not as a forecasting tool, but as a projection tool, right? Because you you won't be able to do forecasts. And, uh, I mean, it's end of century anyway, so that's probably meaningless. But it's uh, the, the 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 power of this when you when you include it when when you when you've done when you're aware of how you've integrated temperature in the model at least is that you get to um, uh, see how the system changes essentially how uh, the projected uh, warming propagates through the system and ultimately the fisheries. All right, sweet. So I have a little summary slide here and uh, hopefully I've, um, I've highlighted that if we are to use, um, I mean my focus is on ecosystem models but I think that it applies in general to uh, ecological models. If we are to use this uh, with a focus on warming scenarios, uh, we need to be aware of what are like model structure and assumptions around temperature. Um, model formulation will determine thermal responses. So that means that it's it also so the fact that we've uh, taken the bioenergetic curves from Seattle and plugged them into Atlantis doesn't mean that we'll get the same outcomes. And we won't get the same outcomes that EcoPath might get. So, like, there's there are a lot of a lot more model components uh, that uh, need to be taken into account, uh, especially when doing ensemble work and comparisons between models. But the first step would be to at least within the same project to kind of be on the same page in the assumptions that we use um, uh, around temperature. Uh, more specific to the slides that you've seen, uh, I think it's good to, when we think of warming, let's not just think of temperature, 
let's think of like what are the what mediates the effect of warmer temperature right on uh, on the rest of the food web uh, because in a model in a mechanistic model like this if all i do is increase in temperature uh, i will get half of the picture and i will lose the other half that is tied to changes in the bottom tropic levels and you might solve that problem by having a model that is amazing at nailing the bottom tropic levels but most of these models aren't this one sure isn't so you have to um, uh, guide it a little bit um, because that's not what they're meant to do uh, that's it uh, but yeah, increased temperature causes higher consumption um, if food is available uh, and food limitation has bottom up effects. Um, and with that, I'll, I'll take questions if there are any. Before I do that, I'll, I'll again, uh, once again, thank the many people that are have been and are working on this and that have chipped in in different capacities. Uh, not all of them are listed, uh, but you know who you are. Thank you, Albi. Um, for those of you online, you can either raise your hand and I can unmute you, or you can drop your questions in the chat box. Oh, okay. So one from Isaac. Do you like to speak, Isaac? Okay. You should be able to unmute now. Oh, hello. Thank you very much. Um, thanks for the chance to ask the question. Of course, I have a question about the hot off the press results about three slides back. There's an interesting result there. Yeah. Um, so, Albi, I wondered if you wanted to walk us through the, the no Q10 case and maybe um, talk us through why there are some instances where the, the assumption of no bioenergetic response to temperature, meaning no Q10, actually gives quite a bit higher biomasses for certain species like arrowtooth and maybe Pacific cod. Yeah, Next. yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll start from that one. Thanks, Isaac. Uh, so the no Q10 scenario is a scenario where there are no bioenergetic effects whatsoever on, uh, on the species. Um, so basically, you just switch off the temperature sensitivity of, of the species in Atlantis. And uh, I was actually more surprised by the opposite case. So the case where Pollock is, uh, has a lower terminal biomass than uh, in the case where the bioenergetic effects are applied. Because when you don't apply them, basically, that y-axis that, uh, I won't go all the way back, but like the, 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 the parameter that ties temperature to biology is 1 basically so there's you know there, whereas typically it's a fraction of one so the, the, the typical case would be what you see here that when when you when you switch off the q10 uh but, but terminal biomass goes up because you don't have you're not scaling uh you're not scaling consumption anymore essentially is what's happening i'm slightly more surprised by the opposite case and uh, that has to have something to do with uh, some tropic dynamics would be my best guess uh, you have some stocks that will be doing better with uh, no bioenergetic effects and maybe preying upon Pollock or maybe the other way around. Um, I, I need to look into it. Um, Sarah writes, is Pollock lower in that case because Arrowtooth is so much higher? That is, very, that is very possible. That is very possible that that's the case. Something related to that was when, when I was playing with F, with fish immortality, Increasing F across the across all species, like you would see, you would see Pollock Pollock biomass going up as you increase F. And like, why why is that happening? Because you're fishing out the arrow tooth, and well, not only that, but there is a substantial predation of arrow tooth on, on Pollock in this model at least, uh, and 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 in the Gulf, as far as I know at least. So that's very possible. Um, Jim, did you have a question? Oh, and as Sarah says, yes, we saw that in the food web modeling as well. I also saw at one point, um, Hem Hutter, 
hand raised. Albie just answered my question when he was answering Isaacs. Oh, okay, awesome. A ton of work. Took some time. <laughs> Nowhere near done. Probably three more years as well. Harris does really nice job putting all of this together. Um, Isaac says, "Great talk. Welcome back to the time zone." Thank you. Well, if there aren't any more questions. Um, we can wrap up. Thank you, Albie, for such a great talk. Um, I'll give anyone like one, a minute or two to raise hands or type quickly. Um, yeah. Uh, just as a reminder, this is the last, or um, we have one more think tank following this on the 13th of June, which is technically in the summer quarter, um, but it's a rescheduling of Kristen Prakatera Johnson's. So. If you are available, then um, please come check it out. Jim, do you have a question? Sorry. I guess not. All right. Thank you, everybody. Have a nice day. Thank you, Albie. Thank you. How do I?